Grateful you could stay with me. I am Pius. Could you back up to our very first story? Finance Minister Ken Ufuriata says government is targeting reprofiling of Ghana's debts from G20 developing countries rather than outright cancellation. Now, government has come under some criticisms over its request to parry club of international creditors for debt cancellation. Now, some argued this will lead to reckless borrowing by government and get us back to unsustainable debts. But speaking on PM Express Business Edition, Mr. Furiata disagrees. Truly, in terms of um, other infrastructure and, and capital expenditures that we are going to have, you know we finally passed the PPP law, mm -hmm. which really is now moving us a lot more away from government, you know, investing in these things into bringing in private capital to support that. And I think that will remove a huge burden and also ensure that governance on a private sector basis is what then comes to prevail. And that will make those changes. So those are important changes and that will then impact the way in which capital expenditures are and reduce therefore government's need um, to fund these projects. When the president was engaging some visitors at the Flagstaff House, mm -hmm. he talked about the fund program getting the program closed in February. Right. With respect to all these things that are happening, mm -hmm. what is the impact on getting the board approval for Ghana's program? Yeah. Um, uh, George, I'm, I'm confident that we'll get it. Um, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, we have a deadline of um, end of February um, for the Paris Club. And so we need to be able to do that. Um, and in between there, we would have completed um, our domestic exchange program and therefore to be able to go to board uh, in March uh, for this to be executed. So we are looking somewhere in March rather to get that's, the that's board correct. approval for it as well. Time. That's correct. Are we sure of uh, getting everything needed to get the board approval? Because some are saying that we need the balance of payment support yeah. so badly. We do need that and it will come approved. George, you know, we, we joined the fund program in July and the president said that we should do our SLA by end of, end of the year. And it looked impossible because it really hadn't been done before. And um, between the fund and, our, and, and the Ghanaian government, uh, we work hard and um, we were able to do that. So it is that same spirit that we are working and uh, I expect that we'll be able to do that. Um, to seal all these issues of balance of payment needs and therefore get an economy that is running with macro stability. Paris Club engagement, yes. I mean, how does it feel? You know, I, I know you've done your, your pitch and your mm -hmm. presentation and all the rest. How are things looking at in terms of our, our debt cancellation? Um, Paris Club is not necessarily debt cancellation. Oh. Um, it's a, um, a reprofiling of the debt um, and basically um, we are now talking about the flow um, to look at um, um, the interest rates, um, to look at the maturity period um, so that um, we can ensure um, that it does not exert any undue influence on that. The issues about um, debt relief and debt cancellation uh, is, is the second issue that government will have to confront. And so you have your domestic exchange program reducing our interest burdens and moving towards 55 percent. You have your Paris Club and other countries program uh, which helps, you know, smoothing out the needs for payments and then you have your external bonds program um, to reduce you know the stock of that of, of, of your exposure during that period a combination of all of that then leads us into the target zone that we're talking about 55 percent debt to equity debt to gdp and 18 percent you know um, sort of debt service uh, over revenue help me with some education please so the paris club engagement is not a debt cancellation, but a debt reprofile, or help me out, please. Yeah, yeah it is, I mean, um, uh, at least in the first instance. You know, there, there are many levels of these things. How do you, because you are looking for financial assurances during this period, um, so that's an approach that you take, and we have said that if this end is not done uh, quickly, and we get into this Zambia, Chad, Ethiopia mode, you know, we'll opt out of that. 
So that is clear that we should do it quickly. That gives comfort to all of these board members um, of the fund that yes, um, these development partners are all behind you in that program. And that will also then um, help us the debt exchange, um, domestic, uh, the Paris Club discussions, and then the bond shareholders. From your engagement, are you optimistic that the club would uh, agree to the request that we put before them. I believe so. Uh, I, I believe we, we make an exceptionally strong case as Ghana, and I think everybody is looking for the demonstration effect uh, from mm -hmm. us. Uh, we did SLA in five months and change uh, hasn't been done before. The same way that we're expecting that we'll do this and also sit with our SNR bond um, holders um, to also look at the future of the country, how to make sure that we protect their investments. Uh, but this is a period in which we all have to help. All right, so that's Finance Minister Ken Ufuriata on debt cancellation there. Let's get a better appreciation of this story and speak to finance lecturer, Professor Lord Mensa for more analysis on this. Grateful Professor Mensa, you could join us on the marketplace. Now, let me get your uh, initial comments on debt cancellation for Ghana. Yeah, normally when you request for debt cancellation, I mean, the signal it sends out there is usually not good. Mm. I mean, it tells um, the investor community that, I mean, you've given up on your own management of the country. And as a result of that, you will not be able to, you know, uh, resuscitate the country as it is going through difficulty. But then when you ask for debt restructuring or reprofiling of debt, whichever term you may use, um, it tells you that it gives the investor some kind of confidence and your subsequent borrowing or your subsequent access to the financial market becomes easier. So if we request for debt cancellation, I mean, it would take us a long time before we can get access to the financial market again. But mm -hmm. then the investor community knows that before a default or before a country becomes bankrupt, there is room for restructuring. And I mean, we're going through the process and I believe that, um, as we opt for you know, debt reprofiling, it gives us some leverage in our accessibility to the international market rather than you know, going for cancellation. All right. Clearly, we heard the finance minister say that the plan now is to seek reprofiling of our debts. Does it really matter? And if debt cancellation or debt reprofiling, really? Yeah, it matters. Mm. You know, cancellation means that you throw your hands, you've thrown your hands in the air. That means that you've given up in rebuilding the country. And as a result of that, you cannot pay your debt. But for reprofiling, you are giving the signal that probably you're doing restructuring, including, including your expenditure lines, including, I mean, I mean um, um, uh, efficient economic management so that you will be able to pay, you know, you know the debts that you owe them. So they, they are completely two different things altogether. I would not advise for cancellation. All right. Now, from where you sit, do you think that at the end we will get um, a debt cancellation or debt reprofiling as, as you so wish? I think looking at the global trend now, um, reprofiling has been the order of the day. And if you listen to our you know, president some time ago, he said Ghana beyond aid. And Ghana beyond aid means that Ghana should be ready for business. And a country that is ready for business doesn't go for debt cancellation. Mm. It means that... You, you're not managing the economy, but I believe, you know, um, for uh, that uh, reprofiling, it's something that our investors will buy on the table. Let's move to the IMF program now, because the finance minister now says is targeting March 2023 instead of the February announced by the president earlier. Uh, looking at how things are going in terms of our debt exchange program, um, where do you think or when do you think we are likely to see this happen? I think um, the, the time that has been set by the finance minister is quite overly optimistic. I mean, March is too early. Looking mm. at the way we are at MANA, we're going through even the domestic, you know, um, debt uh, restructuring or debt exchange program. Look at the investor identification, how we are struggling with it. And I believe that the March is too overly, it's overly optimistic. And uh, uh, we should look at somewhere middle of, I mean, this year, 
get into the latter part of the, the last quarter of the year. Well, uh, Professor Mensa, recent development is that the Association of Rural Banks has asked for exemption from the current debt exchange program. How is the program affecting the banking sector from where you see it again? Yeah, of course, uh, rural banks are also, if you also invested in government bonds, I think the last time I checked from the 2021 you know, um, government report, they have about 1% uh, in the government total you know, debt uh, portfolio. Uh, so effectively, uh, once they see the trend of exemptions that is being called for, obviously, they will also jump into the wagon. And they had this exemption call has a contagion effect. Mm. One thing I will propose is that government should, you know, find a way to meet the entire investor community together, individual investors, banks, because they are interconnected, pensions and all those you know, that forms part of the government portfolio. And then meet them, possibly explain to them uh, those who can easily get exemptions and those who cannot. Because um, at the end of the day, we need this exercise to bring down our you know, expenditure so that the, the, the country can have that fiscal space to operate. And so if you, 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 you but then we shouldn't treat them in isolation. If mm. you meet them individually, each of them will come with different, you know, um, um, requests all together. And um, bringing them together, you'll realize the possible, you know, effects that each of them will have on themselves. And I think the state will have a very good bargaining power. I believe if the proposal on the table now is revised, I think some of them will buy into it rather than calling for complete exemptions. Mm. I want to know how this may reduce the level of confidence in the sector, and if it will, what um, will be the impact? As we speak now, it has. It has, you know, um, there is an impact, and you can see um, treasury bill demand swelling. Mm. And that tells you that investor confidence has what moved from long term, I mean, government instrument to short term. So you see people doing more of what ninety one day and then, you know, rolling over. So if you look at the interest rate structures, you can see that, you know, the bond rates are coming down, whilst, you know, the, because there's demand on short-term instrument, you know. It seems Professor Mensen's line has frozen, and we shall bring him on to speak to us on this developing story. As in, when we get him, we shall bring him on to speak to us. Now, let's touch on some other stories. Now, the Bank of Ghana has disclosed that it has the full support of mining firms to sell about 600,000 ounces of gold to them this year. According to the central bank, there's been an extensive collaboration with the mining firms to provide enough gold to show up the reserves in the gold vault. Now, this is coming at a time there are sessions that the regulator is coercing mining companies sell the precious metal to them in their quest to sustain the gold for oil initiative. Speaking on the polls, head financial markets at the Bank of Ghana, Stephen Opata, said the commitment level of these firms is impressive, hence hopeful of achieving the target. We've, been, we've had extensive engagement with the Chamber of Mines. If you recall, uh, somewhere last, last year, I think around August and September, of course, led by the uh, Office of the Economic Management Team, we agreed on a collaboration with the Chamber of Mines where uh, we, they agreed to sell us some quantity of refined gold at established refineries to help um, provide more resources for our reserves. That program has gone very well. It was a collaborative program. What we sought to do, or I think the announcement that was made by the Honorable Minister of Lands and Resources, uh, indicated that uh, for this year, or, or they, they were supposed to sell us 20% of our their uh, gold exports. Right. So really, um, to clarify, this is not new. We have started that with them already, and we've had extensive collaboration. Maybe uh, the 20% is what may be new to them, but we had actually agreed in principle that this year the mining firms were going to uh, sell about 600,000 ounces of gold to the Bank of Ghana. And this is not new. This is collaboration we started last year. Uh, we have, uh, based upon some of the news that has come out, engage them further and we we expect them to collaborate and be on board and agree to uh, share the 600,000 ounces 
that the industry has indicated that they will sell to the Bank of Ghana. So I think there has been engagement, and we expect the collaboration to continue. Uh, I must thank the Chamber of Mines and the, the, the mining firms that delivered last year. As a matter of fact, last year, our target was to do about 120,000 ounces. I'm happy to say that about 80,000 was achieved. Uh, the 40,000 we could not achieve was due to some documentation delays, but there's even commitment that they will do that. So we must really acknowledge the help that we are getting from the Chamber of Mines. All right, let's, so let's go back to our earlier story where Dr. Lo, uh, Professor Lord Mensah was telling us about the impact of the debt exchange program on the banking sector. Professor Mensah, um, grateful you could join us back again. You were making a point on the impact this would have on our banking sector. Can you finish up with me? Yes, the investor confidence, um, it has had impact. And clearly, you see it on the uh, swelling up of the demand for treasury bills. And, you know, um, when normally um, the long-term investment shakes up like that, obviously you get investors moving to short term. Their horizon changes to short term. And that is why we see, you know, treasury bill demand, you know, increasing. Are we going... Um... Are we giving too much, would you say, as a country in terms of getting the IMF program? Yes, yes. I mean, we're giving up, uh, we're giving more. And uh, of course, giving it more uh, means that we anticipate a certain reward into the future. And the reward is going to be to have uh, that fiscal space and then also get an IMF inflow and then possibly look at the, uh, the, 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 the way we can stay fiscally you know, discipline when we get this IMF program, as far as the conditions that they attach to their support is concerned. But then uh, we're giving so much because um, the exercise that is going on, I mean, of course, as your earlier questions, I mean, indicate, will affect investor confidence. That is why, you know, I look at this exercise as an economic exercise, which we are looking out for a benefit that I've already indicated. But then the cost is to ensure that we maintain investor confidence throughout, you know, the exercise, so that you know, um, after the exercise, we can bounce back as expected. Because the interest rate and all those that are going to be slashed, if we don't tend to be, you know, find our feet back, you know, the economy, um, it will be a double loss to the um, um to the investor. So uh, we're praying that in the process of getting the IMF program we don't completely, I mean, lose the investor confidence. All right, so a quick thought on um, the current uh, technical meeting with government on the possible review of the uh, zero coupon on maturing debts. What is really, what are you looking at at the end of the 10 day period? Yeah, the zero coupon and then even the 5%, the whole structure, the whole, you know, proposal on the table is, is quite, quite questionable. And like I mentioned earlier, the investor confidence is very, very important. I mean, the Ghanaian investor has never witnessed a single digit inflation before. Neither have they witnessed 0% coupon before. And even the 10%, um, which risky investment in Ghana will give you 10%. Historically, we've, we've never had that. And so the whole investor space is, is quite in a shock. And that is why you know, probably you get the entire, you know, community calling for, you know, an exemption. And I believe if the government ups its game and try to reprofile the debt in such a way that the uh, investor will be comfortable in a way not to deviate too much from the investor's expectation, I think they should, they, the government should get a buy-in of the investors. Possibly look at the target. If your target is to hit the $137 billion within the next um, two years, it's about time you look at it economically. Probably the, the two years is quite you know, restricted because of the, uh, the, the political undertone. But if you should reprofile it and look at it with economic sense, and then maybe you target it for five years, it should be able to bring the interest, the coupon payment up a bit for our investors. So that at the end of the day, um, these are total exemptions and all those that investors are calling for will come down. We, we are giving more. We are giving more. Uh, we hope that the benefit will outweigh the cost that, I mean, we anticipate. 
Great. Thank you very much, Professor Lord Mensah, for your time here on the marketplace. He is an economist and also um, a finance lecturer speaking to us there. Now, next, our business advice series and managing businesses in an austere economy. And today, we are joined by Prosper Melome, partner, Corporate Transactions and Investment Banking at Bridgewater Advices Limited. Welcome. Prosper, once again, thank you. Good thank to have you, you in our studios. Now, what does it mean um, when businesses go through difficult times in this year by way of managing our businesses? All right. So I guess you are referring to financial distress. Exactly. So. Yeah. So yes, uh, the the economic times are hard, and when we talk about financial distress, we are looking at a business's inability to meet its mm -hmm. obligations as and when they fall due. Right. So this is this is the core of it. Now, there are a number of things that may, may lead to distress mm -hmm. for businesses. The chief amongst um, these reasons is um, overborrowing debt, okay. large debt. Okay. So when you are over leveraged as a business, I think that's a classic case of Ghana, mm -hmm. okay, on a national level. Okay. So we have a lot of debt. So that's reason number one. Reason number two are macro issues. So when the macro environment is not good, I mean, if you look at the fundamentals currently of our economy, it's not the best. So these are some of the reasons that businesses, but there are also other reasons as combination of number of issues. You have uh, poor management, uh, industry-related issues. Uh, there's even things such as regulations within a space that can cause businesses to go into to distress. All right, so when you find yourself in this situation, um, what do you do? Well, there are, there are a lot of options. It depends on where the business is in terms of, you know, there's a distress spectrum. So we have businesses that, that may be mildly distressed, mm. that may be moderate or severe. All right. All right. The decision as to how to handle distress varies. So in a mild case, for example, it may be due to cash flow issues within the cash cycle of the business. So you're looking at managing or adjusting liquidity within that space. As it gets severe, there are also other things that must be done to, to deal with this. But generally, if you look at the causes that I mentioned earlier, with regards to what causes financial distress. Mm -hmm. We are looking at number one, the, the high borrowing. Okay. Number two, the issues as it pertains to the macro environment and then other factors. Okay. So if you manage your, your debt profile, borrowing within debt capacity, you are able to handle issues with distress. If you go out of your debt capacity, then that becomes extremely challenging. And what are the options for you? Oh, we have a number of options. I mean, currently I'll talk about the um, um, corporate Insolvency and Restructuring Act, mm. called CIRA, that was passed in 2020. Okay. Now, this act is supposed to give um, room for businesses to navigate the issues of distress, particularly in the event of insolvency. So within insolvency, uh, we are talking about when you're, you're, you have a negative net worth, where you have your, your, your liabilities bigger than your, your total assets, your total liabilities, higher than your total assets. In that, in that situation, CIRA allows you, as a company, particularly a limited liability company, to invoke um, going into administration as a possible option for a business, mm -hmm. right? And that would, that would trigger the appointment of an administrator. That would consider the possibilities of a restructure to turn the business around, or where it wouldn't work, probably consider liquidation. Mm. And what would be the expediency level of, of this option you've outlined? Well, it, it depends on the, on the situation. You know, even restructuring happens um, at different stages. Some of the restructuring activities do not even require you going under the law of CIRA okay. to activate, right? Mm. Even the management of a business can do some form of restructuring. Mm. Now, I'd, I'd like to chip in that when it comes to restructuring, we have operational restructuring and financial restructuring. Right. When it comes to operational restructuring, we are basically looking at reorganizing the operations of the business. But financial restructuring comes, to, comes with adjusting the balance sheet of a business. Mm. Okay. And so within the, 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 the powers of the company, the company could go ahead and engage an expert advisor to, to initiate a restructuring process. However, under the law, they are, in terms of CIRA, mm. there are directives and it's very specific as to the timelines with regards to that process. All right, uh, Prosper, we are indeed grateful for your time here yes. on the Marketplace. Grateful for joining us in the studio. All right, so that's it for the program for this afternoon. I am Pius Kujubaka. For more news, you can log on to myjoyonline.com forward slash business. We'll leave you with some currency updates.